Humane Pin goes up on the auction block, and Microsoft's AI is taking screenshots. This is Mac Voices. Mac Voices is supported by the Mac Voices Slack. Discussions, questions, and answers, and a place to talk tech with your friends. The Mac Voices Slack is available to all patrons of Mac Voices. Sign up at patreon.com slash macvoices and join in. This really isn't us, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, but <laughs> the Humane Pen uh, maker is reportedly seeking a buyer. This is one of those devices you looked at and said, okay, is this the next step or is it is it a step toward the next step? And it seems to have failed miserably. And now they're looking at cashing out allegedly for between 750 million to 1 billion, according to Bloomberg. Jeff? First off, bless their hearts for thinking they'll get that much. Um, but um, the news here for me isn't that they're trying to sell. Uh, when they initially unveiled the product, and were giving us the, the demo videos and all that, I looked at this thing, and my first thought was, this is not a company that is working to, to come to market. This is a company that was spun up to be sold. I think that's been the end goal of this from day one. And uh, and the problem is the product that they, they created uh, needed to perform okay for this to be a viable sale because this is about we're spinning up technologies and uh, and that's it it didn't pan out and so now they're stuck with a company that uh, that they can't really sell very well because they didn't get the technology together that they needed to to make this actually a sellable product um it uh, but what it does show is that that there is an interest in wearables and i and i'm feeling like right now the company that uh, that is most effective in the wearables space is apple so that's the company you're going to have to beat and it turns out that uh, humane didn't do it Jeff, it says that they they raised an initially raised two hundred and thirty million from high profile investors. So I, th I I think you're right. I think this shows the interest in wearables. Does it also show the fact that somebody wants to be on on what might be the next big thing, and they're willing to throw a couple million here, a couple million there at it? Yes. However. I think that the way you are thinking about that and the way I'm thinking about it might be a little bit different. Uh, and I, and I'm assuming what you're meaning is they want, they want to be part of the next big thing and the, the next big product. And they, they want to be part of the next iPhone or, you know, what, whatever it is. Yeah. I think it's really, they, that what these people wanted to do was invest in what's seen as the next thing so that they can raise a lot of money and cash out with a big profit. And it doesn't matter if the product is actually a thing as long as the proof of concept, which in this case is the AI pin, works well enough so that this can be sold off and it's about IP and code and talent, not about the actual product. And they tried to ride that wave. And in this case, I don't think it's going to pay off for them. I mean, in looking at it, and the, I've never had an AI pin in my hand, uh, or excuse me, a UAN pin in my hand, so I don't know. But it, it looks like the IP is sort of offshoots of things that exist in, in maybe in better form other places. So I'm I'm honestly trying to figure out what what it would be worth. Brian? Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking maybe along those same lines. Um seeing the demonstration of the unit, you know, where you know the demonstration almost looked flawless, you know, in the way that they presented it versus the real life um you know how it actually is working for people uh, who actually buy the unit. Um I'm seeing you know what 
what problem is it solving in my life, you know, and, and trying to ask myself, you know, is this a solution to a problem that doesn't exist? Or, you know, is there some sort of the other way around type thing that, you know, this would make things so much more useful and, and helpful. Um, but to what uh, Jeff had mentioned about, like, maybe some of that, that coding, maybe some of the the ideas behind it, maybe it just isn't quite mm-hmm. formed in the right way, perhaps. I don't know. Marty? I think they were trying to tap into the Star Trek vibe, you know, the mm-hmm. little communicator pin that you can have on your chest and do everything. And I'm usually a, a sucker for these kinds of things, but I'm not a $700 sucker uh, for, for a device that basically has everything I have in my phone anyways. Um, and then $24 a month to access the company's artificial intelligence. Um, I just, uh, just can't see it. Couldn't see it. I mean, I've got a set of Google glasses in my closet that I can't use. This seems like it would be headed the same way. Yeah. Um, $700. Er- Is that how much that thing costs? Plus a subscription fee? Wow. See, you would need artificial intelligence after that. W- with all that money that you have to spend just to use this, it, it just drives home for me that this is proof of concept that people are throwing money in hoping to to cash out. MVP, MVP, but in this case, it means minimum viable product. We made something that didn't make people want to test it in their Blendtec blender, and that's all the further we needed to go. Eric, Eric, sitting up in the corner of my screen, chuckling. Were you? Don't tell me you were a seven hundred dollars sucker, Eric. No, no, I, oh, I was thinking good. that they should have just released this as an app and put it on everybody's iPhones. And they could have just put yep. blinky lights on the thing that she tapped and it wouldn't have to really do anything but have a Bluetooth connection to the app. And they they would have sold a gazillion of them. You know, hold your hand out and have it beam stuff in your hand, but really the phone is doing all the work. It'd be a lot cheaper. Or they could have named it a Vision Pro Lite. That would have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> would have been a $700 investment right there. Would that be Vision Amateur? <laughs> <laughs> or vision what vision pro sucker probably vision enthusiast yeah. vision enthusiast when when i was reading the headline and, and the, what they were asking for i thought jim ray was going to choke um i was a little worried about him <laughs> you okay jim um by the way i, I won't take less than two billion dollars for my company <laughs> <laughs> that's still a steal uh, yeah for who Yes. <laughs> so this one is, I, 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 yeah, this is just another one that you you can't believe. Microsoft has announced a new function called Recall that yeah, claims to be this. doing, it will monitor everything you do on your computer all the time. Now, Let's be fair here, which is really surprising coming out of my mouth when it comes to Microsoft. We have apps on the Mac that do this already in a sense, okay? Something like um, uh, Text Expander is always monitoring what you're typing. Now, that's different. Cal, you're shaking your head. It's a different thing, but it is watching what you're typing. It doesn't It doesn't. Come, doesn't remember everything. Um, you could argue that some of the backup programs – are sort of doing this because they're not watching what you're doing, but they're storing everything and then offloading it to someplace in the cloud. So there, there are a couple of places here that we have some precedent. And by the way, there are some Mac apps out there that happily offer to capture everything you're doing for you. So they're basically the equivalent of this. This, from what we know, is going to be built into the operating system. And, and sorry, man, but it's Microsoft. And now the EU is looking at it from the screenshot screenshot perspective as to, you know, what it's capturing and where they're going. And and Kelly's about to jump out of her socks if I don't let her speak. <laughs> I've been watching this very closely. I've um, been party to a lot of conversations by people who absolutely know about this. And there are some huge things to be aware of with this. First of all, 
Um, you did bring up text expander. Text expander records nothing. Um, it holds on to something. It's it's like a. I don't want to bore anybody. It's basically transactional. It looks at what you typed, and then it's done. It it looks at it. It never leaves your device. None of that can go anywhere. You can't go back and look at what Text Expander is doing in order to find out what somebody was typing on their computer. Um, text Expander, as I'm sure everyone on this panel who's been a Text Expander user knows, uh, turns itself off at the drop of a hat. And it does that to be overly cautious about making sure that it's not capturing a password or any financial information or anything that you're typing into a secure input box. The new thing in Windows 11 does not do that. It captures passwords. It captures personal information. It captures all the things that you are doing all the live long day. And there is no way to turn it off. There is no way to manage it remotely. So someone like David and I who have fleets of machines to manage and the, if they run Windows, this is running on them. We can't do anything about it. And it is recording literally everything. And they're proud of it. Now, yes, I have Time Machine. Yes, maybe I run Text Expander. Maybe I have uh, something else that I use to take screenshots of things regularly or something like, um, uh, you know, one of those, um, uh, not Grammarly, but something similar to Grammarly that looks at what I'm typing and says, maybe you could format that sentence <clears throat> a little better, something like that. Um, I can quit all of those apps. I can stop using Time Machine and it's fine. I can quit the text expander app and it's fine. I can quit the made up Grammarly app I just pretended to have on my computer and it's fine. And then those things are not listening. They can't do anything. They can't see anything. They can't report anything to anybody. And this is happening all the time, whether you want it to or not. And if you are a person whose privacy is perhaps paramount because you are in danger. Maybe you are a victim of a person who's been stalking you or a victim of somebody who's been abusing you or a victim of all kinds of other crimes that are really, really bad things that people do to other people. This hands someone the key to making that a reality and finding out all the things that you are doing on your computer at any point, whether you want them to or not. It is a bunch of things that I am not going to say as a measure of my love for Chuck and knowing that he does not want to spend the rest of his life editing this episode. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Marty. I, I read something not to disagree with Kelly at all, but there, what, what I read said, this is all on there. It's default, but you can go through and you can shut off what websites you don't want it to record. What I don't want to, a, a a app or a service that is supposed to be a convenience that I have to go through and figure out every place it shouldn't go or that I don't want it to record in. Um, it just seems backwards logic. I mean, if I, if I wanted to turn this function on, I should have control to turn it on and to add the pieces that I want, not take all out of the, take all the pieces out that I don't want. Yep. Opt in versus opt out. Precisely. But also, even if you turn all of those things off, there is the the last thing that I saw about it, and I can't remember where, the last thing I saw about it was even if you flip all of the switches that it gives you, and there are so many switches, and if you flip all those switches off, and I mean literally not metaphorically like I want to do, um, then it's still in there, and there are still certain situations where data gets captured. And so um, the last I saw was that like there is no way you can't go uninstall, you know, like you can go yank out a TCP IP stack or something if you really want to make sure that thing. And so I can't that figure out changing, but yeah. I just can't figure out why I would want to use this or why most consumers would feel a need to use something like this. I I think I know yeah. Microsoft's logic on this one. And I'm not, and I won't say this as a defense, just what I think their logic might be. Wouldn't it be convenient if you could search for anything on your computer in context? And that context being, I was on uh, Mac Voices Live last week, and Marty talked about a website. How do you search for that on your computer? Well, with this, in theory, you can. So 
with that sort of logic, I can see where this could progress to. And now we have uh, Microsoft, uh, what do they call it? Rewatch? Rewind? Rewatch? Whatever they're calling it. And recall. Recall. Overwatch? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, who, who watches the Watchmen? Um, but what we end up with is something that that for me falls under the Jurassic Park axiom, which is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, Eric? Yeah, for all of the people who are upset about air tags and how, you know, it, it's a tracking issue or whatever, um, you know, definitely valid concerns. This is a thousand times worse. Uh, most people, I don't think, will even realize this exists. And, you know, anyone reaching out for help or assistance, not realizing that the next day somebody could say, hey, summarize all the contacts that, uh, contacts that occurred when I wasn't present and have a whole list of, you know, everything that happened be replayed back. It is just a disaster waiting to happen. Everyone who wants to remotely chat with their doctor because they don't want to go in or can't go in, uh, where one of the things you say is, yep, I'm in a private room and I'm by myself and no one's coercing me and, you know, all the stuff you agree with, this is a whole other thing to check for. Ben Wraith couldn't be with us tonight, but he's in the chat room and he says, I can guarantee businesses will make them shut this off. This is an infosec nightmare. It's it's worse than an infosec nightmare. I mean, it's just a nightmare across the board. Because if it, I guarantee you that I've clicked wrong websites, I've loaded wrong websites. I've clicked the wrong thing. Sometimes a legitimate website will load something that I would rather not have recorded, because you know then it's it's on the record, if you will, whatever the record is. So I just can't. I mean, Marty, what did you say? Reverse logic, which I think defines Microsoft. Um, you know, and and again, it's it's not a company that has a great track record for taking care of our of our personal data. If we if we choose to, if we desire to have it taken care of, even just like I think because I deal with Microsoft a lot as part of my day job. I'm in IT. We have lots of different clients and lots of different clients who have lots of different setups and lots of people who are using Microsoft products. So I get alerts for all kinds of service things. And I get alerts for things like you can't view reports in the admin console. It's been happening for a while. Um, Maybe it'll come back. Like a lot of the like and then we will get them for, you know, multiple different accounts and the kinds of things that show up like users may not be receiving all of their email is an alert that I have seen more than one time. Um, this kind of like that's the and I understand it's an, it's a huge organization. The amount of data that goes through there, the amount of stuff that they do manage to block the amount, the, the number of people that don't get in that shouldn't get in. And I know that they publish numbers about the kinds of things that they do block. It's not like they're not doing anything. but for a company to be this tone deaf is honestly the thing that really, really surprises me given the rise in places that have to be compliant to a certain level of security because they work with personal data or places that are medical and have HIPAA requirements that they have to worry about. And these aren't things that are, it would yep, be a good idea. Too. Yeah. It, these are not, it would be a good idea if you did this. It is, you will do this or you will do nothing at all. And these are your two options. It's a binary system. And more and more places are having this dictated to them as well as like, and you need to get certification from all your vendors that they also have this level of compliance. And you could be checked for that at any moment. This is the kind of stuff that I deal with at work sometimes. And it blows my mind that they put this out and appear to be baffled that nobody's excited about it. <laughs> Um, I want to, I want to come back to that point, Kelly, Jeff. Uh, so as we've all been talking about this, I just had this image pop in my head of someone who's using a windows 11 computer with recall on it and their Samsung phone stops working. Right. So they take that in to their, to their service center. And now <laughs> it's like, 
what do you mean literally everything in my digital world is either being sent off to Samsung or recorded and stored and potentially available off of my computer? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Marty? I, 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 I really wasn't in the query, but oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Guy, pardon me. I'm sorry. It, you look so no, like some people lie. think of me as Marty, you not, look. not that Marty, but just, you know, Marty in general, more like I, Marty uh, McFly. McFly. I think of myself as guy. Yeah. There you go. And I apologize. I you apologize for that. Um, <laughs> the only way something like this would work in the private sector would be if, the, the company or, or organization was already allowing or part of the, the Microsoft 365 experience where, you know, instead of having personal servers for all of their data, they're just kind of passing that off to Microsoft and that they would be able to turn, not so much turn on, but have all of the stuff that's related to all of the computers in their particular organization only at their beck and call, not necessarily going all the way back to Microsoft. Uh, otherwise I, I can't see any, any company or government uh, ag agreeing to go along with this. No, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so confused. What was the last point you made? I wanted to come back to, I'd lost it completely. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. That there was some point you made that I thought that like, Microsoft rolled it out and pe and expected people to be happy about it. Yes, that's the way I wanted to. Thank you. That's the way I wanted to wrap this up because it goes right back to something we were saying earlier. If Apple rolled this out, there would be riots in the streets. And, but Microsoft rolls it out, and the most they get is people are like, eh. People, yes, but people who watch this kind of space closely, the people who. Um, people like us who sit around and look at like, you know, I'm always interested in what Microsoft is doing with Windows because I want them to come up with something awesome and force Apple to compete. Um, I'm always curious about what the Linux people are up to because, you know, this year is the year of Linux on the desktop. I've heard and, that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry to everyone listening to the audio only version who couldn't hear the winking at the end of that. But um, <laughs> like the like. I'm always curious because I want to know what kind of stuff another company is going to do as part of their operating system that's going to make Apple sit up and take notice and go, but if we did that, we could do it better, you know, or something. And that's the part that I am always curious about. So I sort of casually observe all this stuff. And I looked at that and went, this is a disaster. And a whole bunch of other people who also look at this kind of stuff and have a vested interest in what Apple's doing next and what Microsoft is doing next and what Google's doing next with their operating systems all looked at it and went like unanimously. I don't know. I haven't seen anyone be the, the lone voice in the wilderness. You know, I think it's wonderful. Not one person. <laughs> so like, honestly, to me, that was the hugest news of this was, uh, you know, Microsoft showing this off and going, you're welcome. And to a person, Every person that has come up against this has looked at it and gone, pass. <laughs> yeah. Brian, going to give you the last word. Okay. Yeah. Well, one uh, comment I read in the article was talking about how, you know, calming people's nerves, I think a little bit, saying that the recall data is only stored locally and not accessed by Microsoft or anyone who does not have uh, device access. Um, you know, when they said that, though, that really doesn't make me feel any better because you know when we're backing up our <laughs> backing up our hard drives it's just going up to a cloud you know which you know generally speaking usually is safe but hacks happen you know break-ins happen things happen once in a while and that's just a whole ton of more data you know when it's capturing all you know your finger you know the keyboard strokes of passwords and such of that nature uh you know screenshots of you know, you tempor temporarily you opened up uh, Bitwarden to look at your password real quick, closing up the window, things of that nature, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it doesn't make it any safer. And I'm a regular user. And one time I had my hard drive crash and I lost a bunch of stuff and that was terrible. So I make sure 
that my Backblaze account backs up every single thing on my hard drive. And I want Great every service. bit of that to be stored somewhere remotely so that I can get it back at any point. And I guarantee you this is not going to be excluded by default. Yeah. And, and please forgive my snark. But um, recall data is only stored locally and not accessed by Microsoft or anyone who does not have device access. Yeah, like Microsoft has yep. such a great track record of having our data secure on their devices. Yeah, so. What? On that happy note, um, <laughs> let's, let's go around, let folks know where they can find you, and uh, we'll get out of here. Uh, take it the way we started it. Mr. David Ginsburg's up first. David, thanks for being here. Thanks again for having me. And then you can find me at InTouchBioS at InTouchBioS.com. Guy Sir will be on the show this week. You can do uh, uh, YouTube at YouTube.com slash InTouchWithIOS. I'm on the Mac OS is live here on Tuesdays. I'm on uh, the Mac show on Fridays on the British Tech Network. And you can find me on Mastodon at DaveG65 and Mastodon.club. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Eric Bolden, thanks for being here. Where can folks connect with you while you're on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> just just think of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's as close as you're going to get. Um, um, you whisper know, I, Eric's name into the wind at midnight. <laughs> oh, wait, that's going too far. <laughs> that could be dangerous. Uh, I can be found on the Vision Profiles podcast with Marty. Um, otherwise, in theory, I will have some pictures going up uh, on Mastodon, EA Bolden at MAS.TO. Great. Eric, have a great vacation. We'll see you when you get back. <laughs> Thanks. Marty Gensius, thank you for being here. Where can folks connect with you and your new cat? Uh, well, uh, Gensius at Mastodon.social uh, on uh, Mac Voices Live on Tuesdays, occasionally join in Dave Ginsburg on In Touch With iOS, and uh, three podcasts, The Tech Savvy Professor, uh, Circular Firing Squad, and with Eric Bolden, uh, the newest podcast that we do weekly, uh, Vision Profiles, a podcast about Vision Pro. And I am going to be seeking, trying to find out where Eric is next week on vacation, because we have a couple of shows to cut, and uh, I might be running those solos, unless I can find him. And Eric just sits there and smiles. <laughs> 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 Guys, Earl, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, where can folks connect with you? Uh, I am Mac Parrot and Vert Shark over there on the, the X thing. Uh, I'm Vert Shark on Instagram and Threads. I am Mac Parrot on Counter Social and Mastodon dot social. Uh, of course, I uh, continue to do the MyMac.com podcast with Gaz as we have since 2009, I think, a long time, long time ago. Um, what else? I well, I, yeah, I think that's enough. Yeah, that's good enough. If you can't find me there, then so sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guy. Red microphone. Red microphone. <laughs> Red microphone. Yeah. Um, for uh, Jim Ray, thank you for being here. For the folks who want to make you a more than two billion dollar offer for your company, where can they connect with you? <laughs> G Searle at mymac.com. <laughs> that, that'll, that'll, that'll work. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you want to buy my company. No, you, you need to get your head examined at least at $2 billion. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for, for, for general comments and whatnot, probably Mastodon's the best place. ProViewGym at gmail.com, and it's P-R-O-V-U-E. Um, and you can also look me up on the web at ProView.com. Thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Jeff Gamut. When you are not here disrupting the start of Mac Voices Live, um, where can <laughs> what? folks connect with you? What? Whoa. What? Oh, you you can get me on email and proviewjim at gmail.com. No, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> on social media, uh, Jay Gamut, uh, pretty much everywhere. 
I'm active right now on Mastodon and Instagram and Threads. All thread, although Threads is making it harder for me to uh, to be active there. I don't I don't get why they're doing that. Anyhow, uh, then shows here on Tuesdays on uh, uh, Mac Voices Live because you keep letting me back. And then Her on fault, Thursdays truck. on Dave Ginsburg's In Touch with iOS because Dave, you keep letting me back. And uh, then on the British Tech Network, Thursdays for the Big Show, Fridays for the Mac Show, and uh, also Brian Chaffin and I do the Context Machine. Great, thank you, Chuck. Good to see you, Cal Gilman. I'm so glad you made it back. Uh, we haven't seen you for a while. Hopefully, we'll see you more often. Where Hopefully. can folks connect with you? Uh, you can find me on Mastodon, where I'm verso at Mastodon Social. Uh, when Mike Rose and I managed to get our collective poop in a group and record an episode, you can listen to us at aftershowpodcast.com. Aftershow Podcast brought to you by Weather Alibi, weatheralibi.com. If you need the weather for that thing that you totally didn't do, weatheralibi.com is for you. Um, you can also occasionally find me over at uh, The Incomparable Network, where I talk about different pop culture sorts of things or uh, play very silly game shows like a show called Turns Out that we just recorded an episode of recently. Um, you can go listen to me be unbelievably excited about the new Deadpool and Wolverine movie because I was on uh, two episodes where we talked about Deadpool and Deadpool 2 because Deadpool is one of my favorites. Um, and uh, occasionally uh, I click the link for Zoom and, and it says host has let you in. So every once in a while you can find me over here. And uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but that probably covers it for now. They'll find you, Kelly. They'll find you. I have no doubt. <laughs> Last but absolutely not least, Brian Flanagan Arthurs, thank you for being here. I really appreciate the extra effort because I know what was occupying you earlier, and it means you came right from that to this. So thanks for being here. Where oh, can folks you. find you? Thank you. Uh, yeah, a few places uh, in particular. Uh, Best one is probably Mastodon, uh, Brian8944 at Mastodon.cloud. However, I was just looking at this uh, Microsoft Kin, and they don't have Mastodon on there. And so you can oh. find me on Twitter slash X, also Brian8944. Great. Thank you, Brian. Now i got to go look up the Kin because <laughs> I still don't remember it. Folks, this it's is Mac Microsoft Wilson. Ken with the smooth front. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, mm. Smooth front of no, never mind. There and we have we have one last face palm before vacation from Eric Bolden. Thank you, Eric. Folks, this is Mac Voices Live. We do this Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, whatever time there is, wherever you are. Join us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Mac Voices TV with all of our other friends. I want to thank the chat room tonight. I tried to keep up with your comments. Didn't always make it, but you were throwing in some great observations and some entertaining stuff as well. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page, and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices, or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.